and that night the neighboring village had come in and they'd started padlocking um people's houses and shops and you know meeting centers and pouring kerosene around the base and setting them on fire and with the full intention of killing people welcome back to when it hits the fan the podcast that delves into what really happens when things go wrong on the road brought to you by Battleface, the tough face of travel insurance now, our story today has its roots all the way back in 1955 and the Oxford and Cambridge Far Eastern Expedition, a mammoth 16,000 mile journey from London to Singapore in two Land Rovers. The first overland, as it came to be known, was a truly classic adventure headed by Tim Slesser, who went on to write a book about the team's exploits. 64 years later, one of the original Series 1 Land Rovers was rediscovered, rusting and half forgotten on the remote island of St Helena. After some serious mechanical TLC, the plan was hatched to repeat this amazing journey, but this time in reverse. The last overland would see the classic vehicle shipped out to Singapore and then driven across 23 countries and 19,000 kilometres until finally arriving to a hero's welcome in London. And that expedition was led by our guest today, Alex Bescovy, who alongside a small group of like-minded adventurers had to contend with a radically different geopolitical landscape than his predecessors six decades earlier. Guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, then do that now to be kept informed of new podcasts uh, as soon as they're released. And of course, if you enjoy this episode, drop us a like or a positive review so more people can find out about us. But without further ado, Let's hear from Alex himself. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on. It's good to be uh, good to be talking to somebody else in the well, not in the real world, but <laughs> as close as we can come at the else. moment. Yeah. Yeah. So no, thanks for having me on. Oh, you're more than welcome. I mean, I've been I've been following along, you know, the last Overland as it's been progressing, and. Um, is, is there a, a a TV series in the works? Is there is there a book? I know I know I've heard certain rumours of this uh, so far. What's happening there? Yeah, they are more than rumours. Uh, obviously, we got back at the end of 2019 and started getting everything together in terms of the post production, the film, and the book. Um, COVID has, has thrown a few sort of spanners in the works, as it has done for a lot of people. Um, it has allowed me to write the book. So the book is is almost ready to go. Uh, obviously, COVID being locked away, perfect time to write to write my book about the journey. Um, the TV series, we are in some very, very late stage negotiations at the moment with a particular TV channel. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to be on screens later this year. So there's going to be a, a series called The Last Overland, which will tell the story of this amazing adventure, which, you know, oh gosh, what a different world when we were able to travel across 23 countries and over four months. So um, I, I really hope that people will enjoy it later this year, because I think we all need a bit of dose of reminder that there's a massive world out there. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I can't wait to, uh, to have a look at this when it's finally up on screen. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, <fair laughs> you're looking at rushes, we've been looking at cuts. So no, there's some good, there's, there's, some, there's some entertaining stuff in there and a reminder of how the world used to be and, and hopefully how it will be again soon. And I guess what one of the times where perhaps entertaining is not necessarily the word is uh, the incident that you're on here to talk about today. Now, this, this took place, I, I believe, in, in Nagaland, uh, which, you know, for those who don't know, it's uh, very far northeastern India. Is that right? That's exactly right. I mean, it's well, interestingly, when you when Nagaland, I mean, some might know it as the, you know, the, the home of the Nagas who um, were famous or are famous for uh, indulging in headhunting. I think the practice has pretty much died out, uh, but generally it's a pretty tough culture uh, to find yourself in. And it's a really tough part of the world. So you know, before I get into the, the moment you've asked me to you know, thankfully relive, cheers. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Nagaland for those you know, who don't know, as you say, is in, in this weird bit of India, which is almost tacked on Called, you know, what people call Northeast India, the Seven Sisters, uh, these states which are sandwiched between China, the mainland India, and then Burma and, uh, and Bangladesh. And they are utterly fascinating. And I was so excited to go because I'd obviously I lived 
in, in Burma for a very long time. Um, I'd been right up to the border with that region, the border with China and the border with Northeast India. I'd worked in different parts of India before. But when I was talking to Indian friends, you know, in Mumbai or Delhi, say, oh, I'm going to Nagaland and Assam and West Bengal. You know, they, it was like you said you were going to Mars or going, you know, going to the moon or a particularly dangerous part of Mars. You know, so you can't go there. It's too dangerous or, you know, and, and obviously the truth is always more complex. But it's interesting that, you know, Indians in their own conception of that corner of the country call it their wild west. You know, it's a place you don't go and it's incredibly difficult to access in terms of bureaucracy and paperwork. Uh, and then also it's home to the worst roads that we encountered in all 23 countries. I mean, the roads were wow. almost non-existent. They were just a sort of, at some point, just a gesture. I mean, we were driving along <laughs> what felt like, you know, a dried out riverbed for hours and hours and hours. I think, I think we actually, we clocked up the slowest day of driving. Um, we covered seven kilometers in about nine hours i think uh going through nagaland and you're going up and up and up and you're crawling higher and higher and higher and the views are extraordinary and seeing the terrain there you start to understand why first of all in, in, in modern day india you know nagaland remains one of the poorest corners of the country one of its sort of least developed one of its least governed uh and that's because it's just bloody difficult to get to um and you know obviously just the the, the forest and the mountains that are there make it a kind of you know, free paradise or lawless corner, have a, you know, whichever way you're looking at it. And there's a long history there of, of secession and independence when the Brits tried to sort of uh, add that part of, you know, what is now India to the British Empire. Mm -hmm. They faced an awful lot of resist resistance from the Nagas. They had to send, you know, all sorts of expeditions up, most of which would come back dead. Um, and, you know, even when India was being uh, made independent, um, you know, even the Nagas still didn't want to be part of India. They they declared independence from India and from Britain the day before India declared independence from Britain. So they've always had this fierce independence streak, mm. which meant when we were sort of finally getting there. So we were what number in? We'd already been through Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar. So we were on country number five. And just to set uh, the scene, this was uh, was it a convoy of two vehicles that you were traveling in? Three vehicles, so three, three Land Rovers. vehicles in total. Uh, so the, the, the core team, there was eight of us stretched across three Land Rovers. So we had we had a 2001 uh, Defender 90 for the nerds out there. We had a 2015 uh, Defender 110. Um, and then the, the, the sort of the queen of the convoy, which is Oxford, which was the 1955 Series 1 Land Rover station wagon, uh, which had done the journey back in 19... 55, 56. So mm -hmm. we were rattling through, um, you know, these roads in a car with no suspension, no power steering, uh, you know, no heating, no air con, no working window wipers. Uh, you know, it was it was not the most comfortable ride. So we were coming up into Nagaland. We've gone through Manipur, which itself is fascinating. The first Indian state that we'd hit. And our guide, Rajan, was this amazing guy who'd volunteered to do it. He wouldn't take any money from us because he'd read Tim's book from the first Overland. And he turned up with the first edition coffin, a copy and he said, I just want to guide you through here because I'm so, I love the story. So, and on the way up, we we're winding through, we had plenty of time to chat. And Rajan was telling us all about the Nagas and, you know, he's, he's, he's Assamese, so he's from the next door state. And even to him, the Nagas are cowboys, you know, and he was saying, well, you've got to be really careful. You know, they are, they're, they're particularly violent. They're particularly hot tempered. And I always sort of take these things with a pinch of salt. You know, there's sort of, people love to chuck stereotypes around about their neighbors, particularly. Um, so I was sort of, you know, taking it in, thinking, oh, you can't be that bad. Until we round the corner after about six hours of driving. And there was a, a group of women on the road, uh, sort of decked out in, you know, not sort of ceremonial gear, but definitely they were quite dressed up for the occasion. And they were averaging about four foot ten. I mean, they were they were pretty mini, um, but they looked really mean and they had enormous sticks and they were stretched across the road. And Rajan, who'd just been telling me these stories, said, ah, here we go. So he, he started to explain that, you know, when there's, when there's a problem, uh, the, the Naga communities in that corner of India, the first go-to thing to do is block the road. Because to block, block the road uh, means the message gets pa passed back that there's some sort of dispute going on and they've blocked what is the only road through Nagaland. So you drop, you've, you've stopped all commerce through, Nag through Nagaland, essentially, uh, by blocking this road. And so we got out of the car, uh, approached Rajan sort of chattering away, trying to figure out what's going on. And when, this, when, a, when a young lad who's, well, I say young, probably about the same age as me, 
came up, um, also called Alex, introduced himself uh, and said, there's been a dispute, you'll have to, you'll have to wait here. And now this, the light was already fading for us and we needed to get to Kohima, um, which was our next night stop. And there's nowhere to stop in between Imphal and Kohima where we were going. Which was how far um, away at this point? Oh gosh, it must've been about 60 Ks left, I think. Okay. Um, and so we, we, you know, it was more than we could do if we, if we were held up. And we didn't like driving at night anywhere and particularly in India because the Indian roads are particularly dangerous, whether or not they're paved or not. Um, which is another whole other story. So we're, 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 we, we were let through this first roadblock um, and Alex, who's sort of taking us under his wing, you can tell he's deeply agitated. Um, and, but thankfully he speaks great English. So he, he guides us down and, he, and as he's sort of walking us down and the cars are following us behind, he explains that there's been a long-standing land dispute between his particular Naga uh, community and the neighboring Naga community. And when they fall out in this part of the world, they really fall out. Uh, so somebody had was fighting over a piece of land and that night the neighboring village had come in and they'd started padlocking um, people's houses and shops and you know meeting centers and pouring kerosene around the base and setting them on fire and with the full intention of killing people mm. uh, so Alex was obviously very frazzled very annoyed and he was trying to tell this story um, whilst we were gently trying to figure out okay well what's the prognosis here, you know, because we'd love to get through. We're not, you know, we sort of come in peace. Um, and on the journey so far, we'd had no trouble. We'd had some mechanical troubles, but we'd already been through Burma, pretty difficult place to be, particularly now. We'd not had any troubles. We were quite confident. So we thought, we'll just explain the situation. We'll explain the story. And I'm sure they'll just let us pass. But then we find ourselves taken into what's essentially the heart of the village that's been set on fire. And we quickly realise that, the, the elders of the village have, have realized that our convoy is a very useful pawn to use to bring the local police and the local military down to settle this dispute. So it quickly became clear that they were going to keep us there until the help that they were sending for or the local judiciary that they wanted to come down came. The problem with that was, and we were sort of happy, obviously, you know, to sit there silently and just wait. But as, um, as we sat there and waited, more and more people started coming in. So you had the roadblock on either side of this village was getting, you had very angry truckers on one side trying to get one way. And you had um, villagers from the different villages getting, who were coming together to sort of peace talk in our, in the village, coming together, eyeing each other up. Obviously, you know, some have just tried to kill the others the night before. And we're sat there feeling pretty stupid. I'd actually just bought this ridiculous Hawaiian shirt as a present for myself. Um, thinking that, you know, I'd just be just driving along and I'm stood there in the middle of this dispute, which you'll see in the film wearing this, in, this ridiculous Hawaiian shirt. It's totally, uh, you know, not exactly low key. Inappropriate and, for um, a standoff uh, situation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, try and become the lightning rod of tension. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to be honest, at the time, you know, we'd obviously prepared a lot. We, we, were, we had some, you know, really, I've obviously, you know, been around a bit. Our expedition manager, Marcus, has, has travelled all over the place. You know, we had you guys on call. We'd already used you, I think, before this. Um, we had a professional security company who were who were there, you know, checking in with us and we, we were tracked and everything. So you've kind of done everything you can. But I must say this was the first time on the journey and there were subsequent, but this was probably the first and the most acute time where I felt incredibly alone. Um, you know, you, you're sort of, one of the things of the journey was this idea that we're super connected. You know, back in the day, they just had paper maps and they would, telegram home when they could we had facebook instagram the internet mobile phones you quickly realize in that situation you've got your seven teammates that you're responsible for their safety you've got a situation where you don't speak the language and you're reliant on one guy rajan who you've just met um you know and as, as, as lovely as you you feel he is this this guy is now your go-between and what was happening was increasing number of armed people turning up so you had um, the local villagers who were carrying sticks and knives. And then you had different, and I couldn't really tell what was going on. Rajan was being very, very, very quiet. He was just sort of sitting and watching and waiting. And I wanted to know what was going on. And we had trucks arriving of different kinds of militia, whether they were state police, state military, and, and military and police is not really a, a distinctive line in that part of India. I mean, the, you know, what you think of police are heavily armed military. Mm -hmm. in that corner coming in with mounted machine guns and you know equipped to the thing and i was trying to figure out from the insignia kind of where are they from are they 
are they federal are they state are they you know local township and more and more people came through and as we were there for about three you know sort of three hours in um this finally this this whole troop of people turn up and i'm just thinking this is becoming an arms race we're getting no clarity and i'm just gently asking alex our, our guy saying you know any chance and he's just saying wait you have to wait you have to wait and I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, obviously in your head, it starts to run away. You know, is someone going to take a shot? Uh, you know, is someone going to start fighting? Is it going to escalate? And I've got my guys in the middle of this, obviously unarmed, but, you know, definitely not, not the way to, um, you know, with no intention of being armed at any point on this journey. Mm -hmm. And, but we were stuck. As I said, we were blocked in on one end and we were blocked in on the other. And um, the scariest moment, I think, was when um, a fight broke out at the... Um, the roadblock which was about 100 meters away from us which was the roadblock out the way we wanted to go and that was the moment and i was filming you know i had the guys with the cameras on just to, just keeping the gopros and the cars on just to just to see what happened and record what could have been our last moments but um you know uh, and you can see in on the cameras that you can hear the scuffling you can see guys running past and david who was filming has dropped the camera down to the floor and just re-watching the footage of that really captured how tense it was because we were only we were in a month into our journey i think we were three weeks into our journey and i really thought that as people might do at this point in an expedition which is supposed to be fun it's supposed to be entertaining it's supposed to be you know a good lark mm -hmm. that you might be getting seriously hurt and that's when you really in terms of when it hits the fan it really starts to make you examine why you've done what you've done and you know look you look around at the people that you've brought in and you go back to you know did i fully brief them on on the full risk when we were going through the risk assessment you never expect to be in that moment um so really as i said you really really feel very alone and even though you can phone or whatever there's you know no one can get to you mm -hmm. for you know for, for for hours days whatever it might be uh, you know a friendly friendly assistance so it's the first time that we were sort of just had to rely on our wits and for me it was a standout moment of it really could have gone either way i don't want to over egg the situation but it really brought home to me that even though we are in a much more connected world now than the guys were 64 years ago it doesn't mean that when you know when it comes to it you're not in serious danger yeah absolutely and i mean how how useful was it to to have then a local guide with you because i imagine with you know, um, language di uh, difficulties and, and all the rest of it, it, it would be completely conceivable that if you hadn't had a local guide there, you wouldn't really have been able to ascertain what was happening or who the dispute was between or why you'd suddenly been taken to the centre of this village and, and held there. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, anybody, you know, who does anything like this realises that you, you know, you invest everything in these guys. And sometimes you can do all the due diligence you want, but sometimes you're given the people you're given, you know, and in some cases on the last overland, we had some people who were, you know, borderline unhelpful or hostile or, you know, useless, <laughs> you know, they just said it didn't want to help, couldn't help. Rajan, thankfully, was not one of them. Rajan, as I said, he, he was there of his own volition um, because he just loved the story. And, you know, for him, he was incredibly um, proud of the fact that we'd be driving through Assam, which is where he's from but we hadn't got to Assam by this point. So I think he was definitely feeling the pressure that he'd, you know, taken on our, the responsibility of our, you know, this crew of eight people from all over the world to get us safely into Assam. And, um, you know, but what's interesting there is, you know, as good as he, as great as he was and is a wonderful man and guide and anyone who's going to that corner of the world, you know, ping me and I'll put you in touch with Rajan. Um, Rajan was out of his depth in Nagaland. You know, Assam is as different to Nagaland as it is to you know, Maharashtra or, you know, or, uh, you know, or sort of Uttar Pradesh. Like they're, they're very different places. They speak incredibly different languages. They have a different culture, different religious traditions. So in some ways, Rajan, even though he was Assamese from the neighboring state and was, you know, Indian, um, it, you know, he was still a stranger. He was still a foreigner there. And if anything was possibly viewed with more suspicion and potentially more hostility, than a bunch of Europeans rocking in there because we're yeah. a bit of a curiosity, but you know, the Assamese and the Nagas, they're, they're neighbors and there's a lot of historical beef between them. So sometimes <laughs> your guide is actually in, in, a, in more danger than you are because he is, you know, he's your go-between, but 
the, the, the sort of cultural historical baggage that he's carrying can, can be a hindrance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was super interesting. And obviously we just arrived in Northeast India and I, you know, I was quite, I'm, you know, very familiar with Burma just over the border. Manipur, Nagaland, Assam, you know, from what, only from what I'd read, this was all new territory for me. Mm -hmm. You know, once you live in a place for a while, you get to understand, you know, body language, tone of language, you know, generally how you should carry yourself. Um, but, you know, <laughs> Interestingly, what actually saved the day was Oxford. So in the middle of all of this, um, well, we had Oxford and Larry's car at the back, the, the Defender 90. And he'd done this journey, well, not this exact journey, but he'd done the overland, sort of Singapore to London. This was the third time he was doing it. And he had a map on his bonnet of the, of the world and he showed Singapore and all the way through. And so what we did is, you know, all of a sudden, everyone was fascinated by this old car. They'd never mm. seen a Series 1 Land Rover. Mm. And so they had the bonnet up and, you know, the guys were like, okay, so how does this, or how does that, you know, was, you, know you know, surely this, and they were all picking through, everyone becomes an amateur mechanic. So in terms of conflict resolution and a way to bring the temperature down, I just opened Oxford's bonnet, let people in, let them, you know, let them crawl over, let them take pictures. And then um, Larry was doing the same with his map, saying, like, say, we're here, this is where Nagaland is, you know, we're going through here, we've got, and everyone's going, you know, wow. So we became, one of the strategies was just to become a bit of fun, you know, a bit of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a great picture that, that I think Leo took where I actually got Rajan's first edition copy of the first Overland book. And I showed him the map. Uh, I opened it on the bonnet of Oxford and I showed him the map from the original journey. And I was reading out the segment where they were in, you know, in Northeast India and Rajan was translating it. And I even actually got the, the trailer that we'd made beforehand where Tim is talking about wanting to do this journey and Rajan's translating it. So I had a group of like 30 people around me watching this trailer on my iPhone. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so I think by that point, they realized that, you know, what we were doing, it was obviously, we're, 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 it's like about being non-threatening, right? Yeah. Um, being really open and honest about what it is you're doing because there's always a suspicion of why are you here you know um what are you doing particularly there's cameras i mean you know this would catch us up you know in china and in central asia where there's just there's just suspicion particularly from security forces of westerners with cameras you know are you an investigative journalist you know from vice are you here to do some sort of expose on you know the you know brutality in the in in the nagaland police or something um, you know, and so just being super open about what we were doing, which was this road trip journey. And the novelty of it as well. I mean, you know, the fact that it is such an odd thing to do, you know, kind of traversing, <laughs> you know, all the way across the world. You know, that, that's got to hold a fascination for uh, for the people you meet along the way. Yeah, no, it did. And it was the best currency we had, you know, and it was the currency we used everywhere. You know, and, uh, you know, people often ask me, like, what did I learn from the trip? And I would say that the world is an incredibly kind place if you are doing something like the last overland where people see that you're you're on an adventure without a particular agenda it's a huge privilege what we did and now to think of it in the covid you know almost out of time now mm -hmm. uh, you know just being able to move freely across 23 countries but you're right i mean the the journey itself the story of the journey and why you're doing it is your biggest asset actually for keeping you safe because people are going, oh, you know, we like these guys, you know, give them some food, give them a bed and then send them on because we want to be part of the story. So, you know, I knew that when we started how special the story was, but every day and then after a situation like this, you realize just how powerful that story is. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, you're right. It does feel like a different world when we could just do these crazy expeditions uh, across the world or, or whatever but hopefully we will kind of return to some semblance of normality if you know hopefully this year but if not then <laughs> soon and um, I'm, I'm guessing your adventuring days are, are not behind you uh, Alex do, do you have uh, any other expeditions you, you have your eye on anything else you'd, you'd like to do in the future absolutely you know obviously the forced the forced uh, stillness has uh, had some creative effect and we've actually planned three uh, subsequent expeditions for Oxford. Um, and we've got a big, big headline record that we'd like to set. 
which I'm going to keep to myself for the moment. Um, but it does involve getting back in that old car for many, many more miles um, and hopefully riding a wave of the world opening and returning to normal because, you know, Oxford and the overland, you know, the art of overlanding is a great symbol of, you know, the basic human desire to wander. You know, what I love about overlanding is it's, you know, relatively accessible. You know, you can just buy a clapped out old, you know, Renault Megane and you can set off for Ulaanbaatar tomorrow or you could have done, you know, you need, obviously you need money for food and gas and whatever, but in terms of accessible travel, overlanding for me is like, you know, the everyman's space travel. It's just, you know, it's so simple, the concept, you mm. know, get in the car, pack your mates, pack your stuff, pack your food and see where the world takes you. So absolutely as soon as i'm allowed to i am itching to go and even though i'm still having physio on my back from the damage that oxford did um to me <laughs> i'm still i don't i don't hold it against her <laughs> <laughs> well if um if, if people do want to find out about these the next expeditions with oxford or or, uh, or any other expeditions in fact what's the best place to uh to, to follow you or the team alex yeah, so I'm 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 all over um, Alex Bes at Alex Bescaby uh, on Twitter and Facebook and at a Bescaby on uh, on Instagram. Uh, if you want to follow the, the 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 news about the expedition and look back through all the stuff because there's some incredible photos and videos and stories out there anyway before the series and the book comes out. So just go and indulge. That's at the Last Overland on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. YouTube's a great resource. There's so many videos on there of, of little snapshots of, of, of what happened, including a little snapshot from Nagaland. Um, there's also a mailing list. Uh, if you go to our website, lastoverland.com, sign up for the mailing list. Our mailing list guys are gonna hear first when the broadcast is gonna be announced and then we'll be announcing on social media afterwards. So yeah, I mean, you know, thank you everyone for your patience for all those who do already follow. Um, we're as just as impatient as you are to get us out to the world. COVID has not been kind to our post-production process, but you know, I think we've got a story that's going to cheer everybody up because it's a story of travel, of adventure, and everyone needs that escape right now. So I'm really looking forward to bringing it all to you. Well, we will certainly cross our fingers here to to uh, to see it this year, Alex. Uh, but until then, yeah. uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, well, thanks to you guys for keeping us safe on the road. So, oh, absolutely. Look forward to working together again. Sure. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Guys, that's all we've got time for this episode. Uh, we're going to be back very soon with more Tales of Adventure. Uh, so if you want to hear about the next episode as soon as it comes out, then, of course, subscribe or follow us on social media, the details of which are in the description below. Uh, until then, though, goodbye.